Hello, you there? Are you there? I'm not sure because we are at a new time. New time this week. It's all different. We did a poll to see who's awake when, and there were a lot more of you who said this time worked better than the other time. So we're trying it out. We welcome you, feedback. Yep. We know it's tricky for the Aussies. It the other way was tricky for the Brits and the Irish and the Western Europeans. And so we do have an Aussie representative here. I represent all We deeply all understand oi, oi, um, oi, the oi. time difference at that end of the world, but we just decided to go with popular vote, which is actually part of today's presentation. Oh. And people are already starting to come in. Hello, like the lovely Vanessa. Hello, Vanessa ah. and Malta. And Rose and Donna and Alexa. Hello. Everybody's here that we know. Loves. Oh, happy Mother's Day to everyone. And Happy Mother's Day to everyone who was ever the mother of a thought and or a dream. A, a or friend of mine idea. once said, some women give birth and raise children but never mother them, and others mother all their lives without ever giving birth. So if you are even a person who is of the male persuasion or identification, you can still be a mother in my world. It's a verb. It's a verb. Mother is a verb. And fur babies. Like, let it be said. We love the puppies. We love the kitties. We love the dwarf goats. Dwarf goats? Mini goats? I don't know what they're called. We know. love those little fellas. Yeah. So if you are a goat mommy, happy birthday to or uh, happy Mother's Day to you. <laughs> happy happy goat day to the goat mothers. <laughs> that is our TED Talk. So, oh, hi from Pennsylvania. We've had a lot of people from Pennsylvania. It's really, really fun. But Allison's in Germany. Oh, very nice. Val is in Ohio. Ohio. Jordy from Melbourne made it. Oh, Represent baby. Represent Melbourne. Oh. Like middle of the freaking night over there, right? That's so goddamn cool. I'm not surprised, Jordy. I knew you could you do said it. You swear. Did I? Yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. You did just now, but it's okay. It's okay. Just, just, I don't even remember. Just the GD. Where I was raised, that would be like... <laughs> <laughs> Where I was raised, you're just getting started. <laughs> and the other words play in my mind. Yes. <laughs> All right. Hi, Kate Grock, live from Hi, London. Hi, Kate Grock. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? And Karen from Michigan. Oh. And Aloha. Jo Joan from Aloha. No, it's Joan <laughs> from somewhere saying Aloha. I wonder where. That's a good thing. All right, we have got some good peoples here. We are getting some love from Dallas and love from the gathering room peeps. And I reckon it's time for some emergent phenomena. <laughs> Boom. Woo! Okay, so I, I wanted to start my little discussion today with a story from my friend Liz. And I did steal it from her, but at least I'm attributing it to her. And she heard it from somebody else. And it's one of my favorite stories of all time. It is about um, a woman who went to China for um, a conference. And while she was there, before she went, she studied Chinese frantically to try to like, she was a high achiever and she tried to learn enough Chinese to, to function. And then she went and while she was there, she ran into a troop of traveling like circus performers who needed to do something with fire. And for that, they needed um, a certain type of lighter fluid or something like that. They didn't know how to express this in Chinese and nobody that they knew in China was able to understand what they were saying. So they asked her, would you please figure this out? So she marched upstairs to her Chinese English dictionary and believe me, as someone who tried to learn Chinese for five years, that's not an easy road to hoe. So after many, I can only imagine many fretful hours of work, she came downstairs with a written note in Chinese characters and she gave it to them. And they went through Beijing or whatever the city was, and they gave it, they went into every store that, that looked likely, and they would hand this sign to the proprietors who would look at this, who would read it and look at them and then just hand it back and move away slowly. So they never did get the lighter fluid. And they went back to the hotel, mission unfulfilled, and they found someone who could actually read the note and tell them what it said. What it literally said in Chinese was, please go upstairs and bring down something different. <laughs> Which, I mean, you can just imagine somebody handing you a note that says that. It's like, 
I don't know what to do. <laughs> so I was talking to my uh, newly fledged master coaches last week in North Carolina. And this became like the theme of the interaction because I realized that what everyone is try trying to do right now is something different. Like we have lived for hundreds of thousands of years by, oh, I don't know, killing things, setting fire to other things, cooking the things we've killed on the fire, consuming them and then doing it again. Um, basically pillage and consume. And then there's agriculture and everything, but that pillage is in its own way. And we have now overrun the earth and we're like, we need to do this very differently. But how? We have an economic system in the developed world that came about in the 12th and 13th centuries as the monarchies um, intention or scheme for making sure that they never lost control of the wealth of the people so that the middle class would equal them in wealth. It was created to, to be a pyramid that would oppress the many and empower and enrich the few. We need something different, but what? We've never had a broad scale economic system like for huge hundreds of millions of people that was anything else. So we got to go upstairs and bring down something different. In your own life, you may have been through patterns of behavior that you've tried and tried and tried to get out of, say, anxiety, depression, um, a career slump, relationship paralysis, whatever it is, you've tried everything you know, and all you have in your hands is a note that says, go upstairs and bring down something different. How do you do that? Well. Long ago, when I was just a wee PhD candidate doing my dissertation, I interviewed a whole bunch of people, like 300 people, because I was trying to figure out how, at the time, mainly women could go upstairs and bring down something different in their own lives because they were the victim of two systems, one of which made them the caretakers of the old, the sick, and the young, one of which said to them, you have to go out and achieve on your own and abandon that system if you are to be considered a respectable individual. These two things collided, there was no middle ground. They had to go upstairs and bring down something different. Most people were just in agony, but there were 10% of the people who began using a form of behavior that is not social. It is actually only found at the very beginnings of societies. When someone goes out into the woods and has an interaction with the gods or the spirit realm or whatever, that so profoundly lights them up that they become attractive to other people. And you may not know, that is how all societies have formed around what is called the charismatic leader. Charisma literally meant someone who could communicate with gods. It didn't mean someone with a powerful personality. It was first brought out as a sociological term by Max Weber in the 19th century. You do, there will be a quiz in five minutes. And if you don't remember that, you will be rigorously punished. My point is that these people were doing something, these women were doing something that was breaking them out of the social mold that they had found themselves in. They were not like traditional, like stay at home moms in their thoughts and feelings. They were not like aggressive, cutthroat individuals in their thoughts and feelings. They moved around and they functioned well in society. In fact, they functioned better than the others. Emotionally, they were in a much better place psychologically, but they were doing things that were altogether unpredictable. So I was groping for something to call what they were doing. And I came to the, the concept of an emergent phenomenon. Now, an emergent phenomenon, listen carefully is when you get a whole bunch of simple components, you put them together and they create some qualitative thing, some amazing thing that is not present in any of the component parts. So for example, one that's most near and dear to me is you take a bunch of proteins, you mush them together, you put in water. What do you get? Well, you get soup, but somehow at some point, you got life. Now, once this life has left a body, it's just a bunch of proteins and water. And there's we don't know how to inject life in that into that. We don't know what life is. 
We have no idea what life is. Life is an emergent property that apparently came from a whole bunch of proteins getting together, none of the proteins being alive in the way that a creature is. So whenever you get um, systems that emerge from lower systems, these kind of impossible, unprecedented things happen. So you get a bunch of subatomic particles together and they create particles which don't act at all like subatomic particles. Newton's physics doesn't appear in quantum phenomena, but when you get enough quantum, like itsy bitsy subatomic particles together, they start acting according to Newton's physics. Um, if you get a whole bunch of atoms together, sometimes they form molecules organized with a kind of biological intelligence that is not there in the atoms themselves. Molecules can coordinate into cells. Now you've actually got a living thing that's doing stuff and nobody knows how that comes out of the molecules. And then you put a bunch of cells together and you can get a human being and nobody knows how the quality of human being comes out of those physical cells or any animal, right? So you can see there's at each level, there's a bunch of rather simple parts that get together and then create something completely different. They go upstairs and bring down something different. And the reason that's so fascinating is that the something different is greater than the sum of the parts. A, a really interesting example of this in economics is that is um, the so-called wisdom of crowds. If you get a bunch of people and a barrel of beans and you say, guess how many beans are in the barrel? Again, follow closely. If you add up all the answers of everyone in the crowd and then divide by the number of people so you get the average answer, the average answer will be more accurate than the most accurate single guess in the crowd. The crowd itself is a better predictor, is, be is better at guessing the number of beans than any individual in the crowd. Here's an interesting part. The more diverse the crowd, the more accurate the answer. So if you got a whole bunch of rocket scientists in a room, the wisdom of crowds would be less than if you had rocket scientists, a whole bunch of like railroad yard workers, my son Adam with Down syndrome and like Lucille Ball, I don't know, but make it really diverse and you're gonna get a wiser answer. The crowd becomes wiser as it becomes more diverse. And we don't really know why a diverse crowd goes upstairs and brings down something bad, different, an intelligence that's different. So how does this apply in your life and mine? Well, I was thinking about this today and I realized that in my own life, I've gone through a level of emergent um, stages where I've had sort of quantum leaps forward in my happiness, in my feeling of integrity, in my understanding of the world, in my relationships and the the, recipe is so simple. It's a combination of experience, emotion, silence, and time. When I combine those four things, and the more diverse it is, the more diverse my experience, the faster it happens. Not the more like intense and focused, like all that time at Harvard was very, very monotonous, but traveling, being with a lot of different people was very diverse. The emotions that come out of that are also very complex and diverse. And if you don't allow all of them, the emergent phenomenon is not as wise and it doesn't come as fast. So allowing every emotion to exist as it is in a field of stillness or silence. And this came to me not that late, I first, ran into the concept of meditation at 23, really started going after it at about 30, and it's been a while since then, youngins. So now I've realized that you've all had divergent experience. You've had lots of diverse experiences. You've all had lots of diverse emotions. You've all had some time. I think the, the part that's missing in our lives that is present in the lives of the, the beasts of the field and the sea is stillness. If you can add the component of stillness to experience emotion and time, and like just let it go, what happens is that that combination of factors goes upstairs. It goes to something completely different. 
and it brings down something different. And one day you're sitting there and you're suffering and you're watching it, all this emotion. Um, this happened to me when I was super anxious for like a month. And one day I just sat there with all the experience, with all the emotion in the stillness and it, it became time. And I just went, oh, okay, none of this is actually as real as I thought it was. And it was just, it was just a little, little opening and I've gone into that ad nauseum. It sort of led me to a new worldview, but it was a calmer, um, it felt like a truer worldview. It settled into my cells as something that I could relax and believe. It was a level of perspective that was not in any of the perspectives I'd brought to bear in my life to that point. It went up a level. And I know I've got a lot more levels to go up, but I really believe take your experience, make it diverse as possible. Let your emotions be as completely whatever. Go to the extremes as long as you hold them in a field of stillness or silence, like holding still and being okay with suffering instead of insisting that suffering not exist. Holding still with happiness instead of running around being manic and trying to make happiness persist. Just being there with the transience and intensity of emotion in silence over time creates an emergent phenomenon that's like life coming into a place where there was no life. And I do believe that if we can do that as individuals, we have a chance of doing it as a crowd. We're back. Lots of people excited. Um, I have a question from Alexa here. That one. Sorry, guys. Wow, someone said they just had that experience today. That's so cool. That's excellent. Um, you might want, oh, here's an example. So you want to read it? Sure. Alexa asks, Martha, do you need to allow every part of the self and process every emotion from past trauma in order to elevate higher? Um, I do not think you do. I think that um, I think you need to allow every part of the self, but you don't have to process. We, we are so into processing in the Western world. And I was just reading this book. I've mentioned it by by um, Stephen Hayes that's coming out called A Liberated Mind. And he shows that according to research, all the processing we've done in therapy in the 20th century actually leads to more anxiety and more depression. What he actually suggests is that we turn toward emotion and simply go into it and feel it sit and feel it in a calm way, experience it and allow it not to destroy you by being very present and saying, it's not destroying me now or now or now. I mean, he sat through the most hellacious panic attacks and it was the, sort of the foundation of his brilliant career as a psychological theorist that he sat there, he, he fled his panic attacks so avidly and he tried so many ways to process them and they just got worse and worse and worse. And then one day he had one and all he could do was turn and go straight into it and feel it and without processing it result like it's like the higher self processes it on its own we don't have to process things the way we think we do in much the same way we don't have to plan out how to have a baby happy mother's day everyone there's an intelligence in the body that you go whoa what is happening and you don't have to do it but you have to allow it. So yes, you have to allow every part of the self, but I don't think you have to process as much as we are prone to doing. Excellent. I have a great question here from Judith. She says, breaking out of the mold comes with a harsh blowback because you function differently than the norm. How can one bend that towards something constructive, synergistic? Oh, that's really cool. Mm. And it's so true. The more you listen to this, the more you do something different, the less culturally appropriate you will be. Like you won't fit into the cultural boundaries the cultural boundaries are the things that are limiting you and causing the problem. So as you break out, the culture fights back because that is its nature. And it too is, it, I mean, culture itself is an emergent property of a bunch of people and it can be more cruel than the cruelest person in the group, right? 
which is pretty damn cruel. So what you do in those situations is you expect, I had a therapist who called these change back attacks. You break a pattern, even in your own, say your small microculture of a family, uh, you break a pattern of say communication. You don't give a compliment when it's, it's expected. You don't um, show up at a dinner when you're meant to or whatever. You do something that's truer for you. You get a strong pushback and what, that does is create emotional responses in you that are meant to show you what is true for you. So if somebody pushes back at you, it's an opportunity to go, where does their response ring true to me? And where do I know that that's not it, that that's not right for me? And I, I've told you guys a few weeks ago about a I, an advisor I had at Harvard who would swear at me and like be just unbelievably brutal. And he was right about a lot of the points he was making, about some he was completely wrong. But I, I remember sitting there going, okay, I'm gonna let these, all this abuse like stream past me and value these jewels of really good feedback he's giving me. So it's a time of discernment. To, and, and your emotions will let you know because when you try to go, with something that's wrong for you, you will feel imprisoned or entrapped. The feeling is not necessarily just any bad emotion. It's a feeling of being trapped. And when you go towards something that is right for you, it will liberate. And it might be frightening, it might entail grief, but it will set you free in your spirit. So I guess it's actually not an emotional reaction, it's a spiritual one. Excellent. Holly asks, are there any way to prevent the change back attacks? go to a cave in the woods. I tried it. It works really well for a short time. Then you need groceries and you're back in it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think that if it's meant, if you're meant to learn from them, they'll get to you. And the idea that that's a bad thing is part of our cultural rejection of suffering. I'm not a fan of suffering, but to think that you have to be spared any type of stressor, emotionally or physically, just leads to, um, to not engaging with the world as it is and not not growing. So no, you can't prevent it, but that's okay. You'll be okay. You'll be fine. You got all of us. We're all out here. <laughs> Some people are voting for the cave. Um, <laughs> Jessica asks us, she says, I relate to the oxygen mask thing. If I have nothing to give now, but take time to heal, um, will there be something to share with humanity later on? Yeah, when you go up stairs and bring down something different. And when you're out of oxygen, you really are suffering at that level that given time and silence will create an emergent opening in you. And what you bring back is what you are. And this is the classic hero saga. You go into the other realm, you go through the road of trials, you fight with the demon, you become the goddess or the god, and then you bring back the gift to the people. The thing is that the gift is so beautiful, you might not even want to come back among other people, but coming back itself and being is the gift. That's how you deliver the gift. Mm. And that pushes the whole, the whole operation to a new level. Excellent, love that. Donna says, when you realize a moment of criticism or abuse is true, how do you recover to move forward without demoralizing yourself in agreement? When it's true, it's not, it's not demoralizing unless you're putting language around it, a story around it that says I'm bad for doing that. If somebody, like I've been watching Rogue put in edits for, um, for a novel and she got some edits that were just like perfect and she went, absolutely like couldn't wait to go put those changes into the novel then if you feel or um experience something being like a, a blanket of cement thrown over you that actually is not something you need to take on at all if it stops you and it gets you stuck it's it's in the old patterns it's not different it's not fresh no 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 that's not truth if it stings, but it stings like antiseptic, like, oh, now I know exactly what to do and this is healthier, going toward it, you might have some embarrassment or shame, tidy that up. We all do things wrong, just like let it go and move into what you now know to be a better way of doing things and you will not feel, you'll not feel blasted by good feedback. No, even if it says negative things. There you go. 
All right, Jane says, I've been asking for more slack on my line, but still find myself looking for an ending point to the pain instead of surrendering. Advice? Mm, it just, it's, oh God, I've done that so many times. I don't want to curse God and die. I have tried to curse God and die so many times and I'm always like, oh, I'm still alive, still alive. And God's fine too. And God's fine too. Um, and so what, what I've learned to do in those times is become very present. And it's interesting because I, I experience them as times of great spiritual, and psychological and intellectual crisis but in fact they're almost always physical they almost mm. always need a hug a, a cup of tea um you know a, some time to sit and breathe quietly it, very simple loving acts get you through this moment and then the next moment and the next moment and it's in the sim simplicity of these acts that divinity reveals itself we think it has to be a choir of angels and you know cherubim with flaming swords and that's what we're looking for and that's what you can get at the movies and it doesn't actually work but when you're sitting with your cat in the screen porch and you watch a butterfly go by and you just let yourself breathe then surrender to the moment allows the divine to come in and then sometimes your mind will explode when you see the butterfly and something completely, you will go upstairs and bring down something different. But even if you don't, that moment is still sweet. And it's that sweetness that you are trying to track through the world. That frequency of sweetness is everything. It is not trivial. Are there any more questions out there? Everyone's gone upstairs. I Everybody's think. gone back stairs, uh, gone upstairs to bring back something different um, that Rhonda was voting for the cave I hear <laughs> you Rhonda um, in there. Um, okay so another question that Donna asked what is a way we can get ourselves not to run away from the anxiety and the intensity of emotion I tend to avoid the intensity by focusing on trying to learn or do good luck <laughs> I mean if you want to if you want to damp it down a little Keep your mind busy all you want. You're going to run out of steam. Keep learning. You're, the dark of night is going to come. You know, after four nights of insomnia, you won't be able to keep reading and the monsters will arrive. Anxiety, depression, panic. And then, I mean, there's a great story about the Tibetan great priest Milarepa who went to a cave to meditate and all the demons came to try to scare him back into his old ways of being. And some, to some, he just taught them. He taught them the Dharma. He said, here's why I don't need to worry about you. And they went away. <laughs> and some he went out with a sword and he was like, get out of my head. I don't need you. You're lying. <laughs> they went away. But one massive demon would not leave. And he tried talking to it and he tried fighting it and he tried hiding from it. And he tried just pretending it wasn't there and it was still there. And one day he got up in the morning. He was so sick of it that he went to it and he opened its mouth and went in and lay down in the monster's mouth and let it eat him and he was enlightened so there again is a story of the ineffable like how do you go to the demon's mouth i think it's when it's like stephen hayes in the middle of his worst panic attack turning and saying well i can't make it go away so i'm going to be curious about what it is i'm going to turn around and look at it and as we turn the you know the part of the brain that is the witness like starts to watch what's going on and we surrender to the fact that we're in intense discomfort and something about that is the magic that creates the emergent phenomenon of the awakened soul it's a mystery in the miller story. it's a mystery when it happens to us but we know that it reliably happens emergent phenomena are so interesting because scientists know that they happen everywhere but we have no idea how <laughs> so well, it's why it's why more than some of its parts exist exactly expression exists. the whole is greater than the sum of its parts and and something happens when you get systems that are sufficiently diverse sufficiently intense and undergoing a certain uh, sufficiently different environment so different variations in things like physical environment emotional environment over time and then blammo in every type of natural system it, in in all the different sciences from the social sciences to the hard sciences biology everything 
emergent phenomena come, something goes upstairs and brings down something different and inculcates this reality with wonders that none of the sum of the parts could ever dream about. So I think we are really actually at the edge where those conditions have happened. And as we gather together and mill about in this way, mm -hmm. we're actually inviting an emergent phenomenon to happen here. Yeah. And I think that's coming. I think it's maybe happening right now. I think it is happening right now. And next week, we have to figure out exactly how and when it will be happening because we're going to be on a plane going Ooh. to South Africa mm -hmm. for the magic. Mm -hmm. So we might have to do over the next few weeks a few little more adjustments to and tweaks to times. We may have to cancel we may have to, one or two. We must, we may have to adjust time, Rowan. Well, if that's all we needed we to do, why didn't we just time. say so? We would go into the booth. Doctor Who or whatever. I used to use Hermione's little time turn, I think. We are so into the literary illusions right now. Doctor Who, Harry Potter. Doesn't get much more Damn. highbrow than that, folks. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we got all the classics. We love you. We love we'll you. See you from planes, trains, automobiles, and rhinoceroses in the coming weeks. <laughs> 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 <laughs>